and I want to just emphasize that I am still the president, <laughs> Elliot. I'm still in charge. <laughs> okay. When do you I step know, down? A little bit longer. I think we're going to do that at the end of August. At the, we're going to have Bill Highland at the end of August. He's going to give a talk on George Mason. Um, I'm going to let Elliot tell you a, a little bit about some of our upcoming programming uh, here in a minute. But but that's when we'll do the actual transition meeting. We're hoping to have Lisa Ezel come down from Washington, D.C. to join us. So we're hoping that'll be a real nice event. Hopefully you can all join us for that. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Elliot Peace, Executive Vice President and soon to be President of the Tampa Chapter. And uh, he'll take it from here. Thank you. All right, just a couple of uh, house cleaning type things before we get started. So next month, June 13th, we have former Florida Attorney General Bill McCollum is going to come speak. Can you hear me? Can you know? Bill McCollum, former Florida Attorney General, is going to come speak about uh, climate change, public use of lawsuits. So June 13th, same place right here on Thursday. Um, as Morgan mentioned, we have William Highland, who's an author, who's going to speak about a new book he wrote about George Mason, one of our founding fathers, called George Mason, the Founding Father, who gave us the Bill of Rights. That's August 29th, and that's a Thursday as well. And then, as mentioned last time, in October, date to be announced, we have Aaron Murphy, who is lead counsel on the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. She's very good. The New York case, which again is the first Second Amendment case to reach the Supreme Court since McDonald versus Chicago uh, a few years back. So that should be really interesting to be right around the time, probably a couple weeks after that is heard at the Supreme Court. So it's a very interesting um, case about the, the scope of the Second Amendment. Uh, also tonight, as we mentioned last time, the Sarasota chapter, we have the Sarasota chapter, they have their novel event, Professor Blackman is also <laughs> speaking on a different topic. So if you want to go down for, Sar for the Sarasota event, it's judicial usurpation of executive powers and judiciary's resistance to President Trump. Again, that's tonight from 537 on Sarasota. This is just a warm-up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a free event. So if you want to make the trip down to Sarasota, there are a few of us who are going. So it'll be a uh, component of Tampa folks as well. So, uh, but today, we have for our luncheon Professor Josh Blackman talking about the importance of free speech on campus. Josh Blackman is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law in the South Texas alone. We got a bunch of them. Yeah. 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 So you, yeah. law school. Josh specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and in, in the intersection of law and technology. Josh is the author of the critically acclaimed, unprecedented, Constitutional challenge to Obamacare and unravels Obamacare with which the group and executive you, power. You hold and the book up on the, yeah. Here's, here's <laughs> the copy of Unravel. And those books are for sale. We're out in the lobby. And I'd be happy to sign. Representative from Oxford Exchange, Cross and Booksur, and Joshua Good, a book signing agreement. Joshua was selected by Forbes magazine for the 30 under 30 in law and policy. Josh has twice testified before the House Judiciary Committee on the constitutionality of executive action on immigration and health care. He is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Josh is the founder and president of the Harlan Institute, the founder of Fantasy Scotus, which is the internet's premier Supreme Court fantasy league, and blogs at joshblackman.com, where I would note he has at least 10,000 blog posts. A little bit more. A little bit more. Uh, Josh is the author of over four dozen law review articles, and the time period appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and other national publications. Prior to joining South Texas College of Law as faculty member, Josh Clark for Judge Danny Boggs of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and Judge Kim, Judge Kim Gibson on the United States District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. He's a graduate, graduate of the Pennsylvania State University and George Mason University School of Law. Thank you so much. Josh Clark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elliot. It's, uh, Thank you. it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my second time to Tampa, I spoke at Stetson a few years ago. Uh, it's a treat to be back. Our topic today is an important one. It's the importance of speech on campus. Uh, now, most of you are out of law school, I think. Maybe some of you are still in law school. But I'd wager that the climate on campus today is different than the climate when you graduate from law school. And I can even say more precisely, since the election of President Trump, I think the climate on campus has gotten even worse in many regards. Um, usually, when I can talk about a topic, I can be neutral, right? Talk as a professor. Uh, but this topic hit very, very close to home. Uh, I was invited to talk at a law school in Queens, New York, the CUNY Law School, City University of New York. 
And the Federal Side chapter there invited me to talk about originalism. They wanted me to do a debate on originalism. Wonderful, I thought. I've done this debate many times. I said, OK, find a professor at your school who will debate me, and I'll debate him or her. What do you think happened? No one on the faculty wanted to debate me. They are not interested. I said, OK, fine. Um, let's try a different topic. Right? Uh, let's talk about why free speech on campus is important. Uh, we all should agree you need to have an open forum on a college campus. I've given this talk maybe four or five times, even at Barry Law School, uh, not too far from here. And every time I gave it, it was no big deal, right? I came, I gave my talk, students asked questions, I left, whatever, it's part of the job. Uh, but something different happened here. Um, a couple of days before the event, I get an email from the student who invited me. And he said, um, Josh, uh, they're planning a protest of your event. A protest? By, again, my topic was free speech. And they were going to protest my topic on free speech. Irony is not dead. I didn't believe them, right? I actually, I was like, yeah, whatever. Kids are lazy. They, they, they puff a good game, but they don't actually do anything. Oh, whatever. OK. I get to the campus a couple hours in advance, like I usually try to do, and the students tell me that there is, in fact, a protest forming in the hallway outside my room. Um, they actually handed out poster board and magic markers. They had arts and crafts time in law school to make signs against me. I'll show you the signs in a few minutes. Um, I was like, all right, whatever. They're going to protest. Then it gets a little bit more dicey. Uh, the school security officer comes up to me. And he says, uh, you know, there's a protest there. Are you aware? I'm like, yeah, whatever, no big deal. Then he says, I'm going to escort you uh, into the room. I'm like, oh, uh, that's new. I've never had to be escorted into a classroom. And then he asks me a question which I had never considered. He asks me, what is your exit plan? <laughs> my, my what? What is your exit plan? This is like rap, like an exit strategy. What is your exit plan? And I was like, I don't know. I'm going to take an Uber. He's like, OK, good. You're not taking the subway. I'm like, oh, that's why he's asking, because they're going to go beat me up afterwards. Um, and it, I, I'm not blaming him. The security guy was doing his job, and he was telling me that we're going to walk you into the room. Uh, and we want to make sure that you can walk out of the room safely. And at that moment, I had this like crystallization, like, this is going to be a different situation. This is not going to be the usual, I show up, answer questions, and go home. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different. And like, OK, whatever. And he says, I want to walk you not only from the classroom, but into the elevator, down the elevator, and out. I'm like, OK, whatever. And at that point, I think, hmm. I'm going to turn on my camera, because uh, I suspected that there would be a show. Um, I'm going to play clips of the video, and it's going to be hard to hear. It goes by pretty quick, but here's a setup. I'm coming down the elevator, turning around a hallway, and there are about three or four dozen students standing in the hallway, screaming at me, jeering at me, calling me a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, a transphobe, an ableist, every name you can think of. And they're trying to, uh, I don't know what they're exactly trying to do, but they were trying to make a point of some sort, right? Okay, so let me play this clip. I hope this works. Okay. <laughs> So that's the first you know, eight seconds. And I don't know if this ever happened to you, but walking down a hallway with 50 people shouting, shame on you, uh, is pretty intimidating. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be a victim or anything, but it, it throws you off your game to have people shouting and screaming shame on you. And some of the signs were hard to see. 
Uh, but I'll, I'll play it again to pause on some of you my favorite side. Okay, so that one says the First Amendment is a shield for white supremacy. The First Amendment is a shield for white supremacy. This one says hard to see. Josh Blackman is not welcome here. That, that, that's not welcome there. Okay. 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 That's I'm white and afraid of everything. <laughs> and it's actually a pun on the Gatson flag snake. That's their little symbol of making fun of conservatives, I guess. I'm not really sure. Uh, let's see the other one. Yeah. The First Amendment is not a legal defense against marginalized persons. Uh, Anti-DACA, not welcome at CUNY. The Federal Society uh, defends white supremacy. My existence is greater than your opinion. Uh, Federal Society is racist. Josh Blackman is racist. Uh, you're all in the Federal Society, I suspect. Uh, so you're, you're, you're lumped in there uh, uh, with that as well. Uh, shame on CUNY. Don't give oppressors a platform. I'm an oppressor. That's, that's, that's where I come from, right? Uh, let's see. Free speech. No. You're not welcome here. There was one sign which is not on this video that she said elsewhere. It said, free speech is fuck you. That was the sign. Um, that's that law students. This sign I actually kind of agree with. It says, your legal analysis is lazy and wrong. I think should at least, at least half right. I won't say which half. Um, uh, oh, there it is. Fuck off. Uh, and that's the little snake, the little Gatsby flag. Um, this guy, it says, conservative hate does not equal intellectual debate. Okay. And this guy, he was the most ballsy of them all. He actually tried to block him from getting to the room. You'll see it quickly. He sort of like stood in front of the door. And I just I pushed him inside. It wasn't very hard. And he's like blocking the door, and I sort of shove him. Uh, and then we go inside. The room's empty. There are about maybe 30 or 40 protesters in the hallway outside the room, and what, maybe five, six people inside the room. And I think we actually have an explanation for why this is the case. Um, a number of the conservative students came up to me afterwards and said that they were um, afraid of being seen with me. They were afraid of being shamed and ridiculed and scorned by their classmates for attending an extracurricular event. So I'll show the rest of the video a little bit later, but at the end of the event, the room's full, about 40, 50 people. In other words, after the protest subsided, people started coming in because they thought it was safer. Um, and I think this is one of the things that troubles me the most about this incident. Um, that students, law students, are afraid of articulating their actual beliefs and views based on a fear of retribution, not from the faculty, from their classmates. That there's such a um, degree of intolerance of different perspectives that they're unwilling to even let their classmates sit through a lecture. That merely sitting through a lecture is like attending a Klan rally which is how they view my presence um, in their building. All right. All right. So let me play a little bit more. Um, and there's a little chanting. And at this point, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, the room's empty. For all I knew, they would be in the hallway chanting, screaming, and I would have to give my talk. Whatever. No big deal, right? I can, yeah, but then they come in. Um, I wasn't expecting that one. That one surprised me a little bit. Um, and they actually surround all four corners of the room so that they're standing right behind me. Right? They're standing inches over my shoulder. Um, and this is when I started to think about, huh, what is my exit strategy? How am I getting out of here? There was, there was one plain clothes cop in the back. You couldn't even tell who he was. And it was me. 
And if they decided to rush me, I was a sitting duck. And you can just see they're standing, you know, inches uh, behind me. And they have no, you know, the wooden placards. Those are very useful weapons. But they have signs, and I guess they could mob me. So, but I made a decision, right? I had a couple choices. I could have, number one, said, forget this. I don't need this crap. I'm leaving, right? Why am I wasting my time with these ingrates who don't want to hear me speak? Why am I going to put myself in jeopardy? It's like, no. I did not take that route. That's not how I approach free speech. Uh, the second one was I could have threw a fit and told the school, you remove those people or else I'm not going to speak. Okay. Now, what would have happened if I did that? They would have said, okay, bye-bye. Right? They say, we can't guarantee your safety. You can go somewhere else to speak, but not here. I was not going to mess that faction. Um, I chose uh, door number three. And door number three is, I'm going to give my damn speech whether they like it or not. Um, but I did it in a very precise way. Um, I recognized very quickly that if I started speaking over them, they would drown me out and I couldn't get anything across. So I said, let me wait. Let them get their energy out. They're, they're children. I said that lightly, but they're children. Right? You have little kids. You let them play, get their sugar out, and they eventually get tired and they take a nap or something, right? So I, I had the same approach. Let them get their energy out. And actually, I played a trick on them. I deliberately started 20 minutes late so that they'd be really ramp, you know, amped up and ready to go and they'd burn out. I, I started 20 minutes late, I was supposed to. So I prepared for this. It had never happened before I was, I was preparing for it. So uh, what's happening here is this guy here is the president of the chapter of the Federal Society. And he's basically pleading with them. He's like, you guys have to go. And I, I'm not saying a word. I'm like, you know, if this is between you. I'm not going to I'm not going to say anything at all. Uh, and he says, you guys need to go. And like, we're not going anywhere. Okay. And that's just a shot in the back of the room. See how close these guys are to my shoulder. And I apologize for the shaky camera work. Uh, but this was not a high production job. Um, OK, and then someone fell in the back. That's kind of weird. Uh, totally unrelated. She tripped on her heels. It was, it was totally unrelated, but she fell in the back and made a little commotion. Um, all right, so now we're several minutes in. I haven't actually said a word yet. Uh, I'm just standing there waiting for the protesters to get the energy out. OK. OK. Okay, so now the guy is trying to introduce me. You give an introduction. Okay, so he, here's my big introduction. Okay, so that's all I got out. We're about five minutes in, and I said, thank you very much, Acuni, for having me. Okay. <laughs> A little, little humor, it's good to start off a talk, right? I was very, I felt very welcome. Then what happens? CUNY is not having you. This is the, the, the intellectual wit, you know, the, uh, oh, this keeps falling off. The, uh, the rapier wit of the CUNY law students, you know, CUNY is not having you. Um, sorry, I'll plug this back in. Uh, sorry, technical difficulties. Uh, oh, oh, I know, wrong thing. OK, so within 30 seconds of my arrival, the uh, students start to protest me, and they start to uh, uh, disrupt, OK? A little bit more. So, so then what happens here is kind of weird. Um, you can't really tell because it's off camera, uh, but there was an African-American student sitting in the back who was actually there to hear me speak. And they said, me, Josh, he's here to promote white supremacy. Why are you here with him? In other words, why aren't you with us protesting? Why are you giving aid and comfort to this Klansman from, from Houston, I guess, as it were? I'm actually from New York City, from Staten Island. And very <laughs> By the way, the CUNY Law School, it's in the Congressional District of AOC. It's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district. That's where this law school is, because you have a sense of you know, topical humor. Um, so this goes back and forth. Okay, so now it gets a little bit better. 
Uh, this woman, she's an associate dean at the college. She comes out of nowhere. I don't know where she even came from. I didn't even see her come in. But she sort of comes out of nowhere, and she's going to lay down a little bit of the law. Uh, I'll, I'll play her message, OK? She never came back. Uh, <laughs> she gave this entire spiel. If you do, I'll be back. She never came back. Uh, absolutely nothing happened to these students. This was an empty warning. It was a, it, there was nothing, and they knew it. She's like, if you do, I'll be back. Uh, and she never came back. And then you can imagine when the dean walks in, they say, OK, fine. But they start talking back to her. Watch this. She did it. Why are you bringing racists into your school? That's how, that's how the students respond to the dean. Okay. And I haven't said a word. I'm just standing there. We're not children, she said. So then this part gets a little funky, right? There's a professor in the back who's with the protesters saying, don't take the bait, right? That I'm baiting them. They thought I was trolling them, right? Use the phrase. That I came to this law school to get a reaction out of them, make them look bad. I, they didn't need my help. Um, <laughs> that's not why I came. I give this lecture at schools across the country on a wide range of topics. But the professor is saying is, don't take Josh's bait. Don't give in to him. And the students then are mad at their professor for actually like not taking their side. He is threatening us. And this is a common me uh, trope that my mere presence, my words, are threatening them. It's not that I am creating an apprehension of bodily harm, committing an assault, right? Remember 1L Krim, right? <laughs> And they say, my mere presence is threatening them. They didn't need to be there. It's a very big law school. They could have been in any other classroom in that building. They could have gone across the street. They could have gone protest somewhere else. But they came here. And they walked to my event and said, you're here, you're threatening us. Right? They didn't have to be there. And at this juncture, I sensed that they were sort of losing their energy. Right? They expected me to be like, you know, Milo. Right? They wanted to fight, and they wanted me to blow stuff up and, and make a huge stir. Uh, I wasn't going to give them that satisfaction. So I'm, I, I, you know, now five minutes in, I haven't said a word. I said, thank you for having me. That's all I said. OK, so here I actually start talking. OK? And I didn't have a game plan. I didn't really have a idea of what I was going to say, but I decided on one course of action. I decided I'm going to abandon my talk. There's no way I can give my lecture. It's, just, it's not going to happen, right? They're not going to let me. So I chose another option. In the days before my event, the students did <coughs> opposition research on me. I can only describe it that way. They went through my blog. They went through the videos of my YouTube channel. And they found various statements that were taken out of context. And they put together this flyer, this pamphlet, of all these awful things which they never actually said, which they took out of context. I swear, maybe Fusion GPS helped them. I don't know where they got this from, but you know, there's, there's the Steel dossier. I, I, it, was, it came from somewhere. And they said all the things that were just false about me, right? And I had a copy of this pamphlet I had in my pocket. And I said, you know what? Let me engage them and walk through each of their allegations against me and explain why um, they're not accurate. I didn't know if this was going to work. I had no idea. But let me try it. Uh, so I start talking. I said, for those of you who are here to hear me speak, I'll try. A uh, little bit of humor. It said, we reject the idea that his views are, are 
welcome space in this campus. That we reject the myth of legal objectivity. I'll say it again. They reject the myth of legal objectivity. These are lawyers, or lawyers to be at least. Yeah, I'm still going to say what I'd like to say. I, sorry, the audio is not a deal. I'm sorry. So they had this pamphlet, and they wrote that it's a myth that the law is inherently neutral. And this is a very common theme. If any of you went to law school in the 80s, remember the crits, right, or critical legal studies, uh, they still have some, some followers at, at the CUNY Law School. So then I want to like sort of warp their minds a little bit and tell them things aren't as simple as they think. Um, so I've given a number of lectures and papers arguing that President Obama's uh, deferred action policy, DACA and DAPA, uh, were illegal. Now I favor the DREAM Act for protecting the DREAMers as a policy matter, uh, but you do that through Congress. You don't do that through an executive action. I think a lot of people agree with me, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but I want to show them, look, it's not because I'm racist. I think that the President doesn't have the pen and phone to do this. Okay. So I try to explain that to them. There was just dead silence. I said, I support the DREAM Act. And I just like, what? What did he say? Is this, is this a David Duke visiting us? Who, who is this guy, right? OK, so gaslighting. You know what that is? Do you know what gaslighting is? It's a concept where you sort of distort someone's reality, where you lie to them and you make them think things that aren't actually true. Now, Elliot, can I, can I order a, a lunch for later? Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking at this food, it looks really good. Usually, usually the food, the pheasant lunches are lousy. I, seriously, but this looks good, so I'm gonna take some of that chicken later. Got it, oh, awesome, you, you, these guys are, in, you guys are in charge. Okay, so I'm saying, Stock a good policy be illegal. And they're saying gaslighting, like he's trying to delude you that this is actually a guy, he's hiding his hood in his car, right? He's actually a Klansman. And they're, they're getting confused. And by the way, she's covering her face with her sign, so she won't be on camera. Um, that's probably a wise move at this juncture. Yeah, you can support something as a policy matter, but find that the law doesn't permit it. it is, this, this is a concept that most law students are uh, uh, woefully unaware of. They think that uh, uh, if you think something is a good policy, then it has to be legal. And if something's a bad policy, it has to be illegal. That is, every executive action that Barack Obama took has to be legal. And every executive action President Trump took has to be illegal. It's not that simple. Uh, a very good gut check for lawyers is if you think there's a really good policy, but the president can't do it, that means you're thinking, right? Do you think there's a really policy that you really hate, but you say, you know what, the president can do it, that means you're thinking. If everything you think is good policy is also legal, you need to reassess your priorities. And I try to get that through to Glossons all the time. Change the law, imagine that. Oh, oh, I spoke over, I'm sorry. Oh, the, 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 the crescendo. Okay, let me just play a little clip. You heard it? Yep. Fuck the law. I said if you don't like a policy, you don't like the law, change it. 
I know that the student, a law student, someone sitting for the bar, probably right around now, in the next couple months, screamed out, fuck the law. And our children in here, I think I'm safe to say that. Fuck the law. And I was like, whoa, where did that come from? I'm like, okay, now I got an opening. I'm going for it. Uh, <laughs> like, he just, he just, yeah. At this point, I won. They knew it, right? <laughs> when, 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 all, when all you have left is fuck the law, you have nothing, right? You, you, <laughs> you, you have no argument. You have no reasoning. You have no ethic. It's just, you're done, right? It's like it's literally throwing in the fucking towel, so to speak. You got nothing left. And I apologize for cursing, but it, it lends itself well for this event. Um, I was stunned, right? Could you imagine if you were sitting in a law school class, first year of 1L in torts, contracts, Professor asks you a question about the you know elements of a contract. You say, "No, f the law." You'd be you'd probably be expelled. I I if a student did that in my class, they'd be in the dean's office in five seconds. I I think I would probably even consider a character and fitness letter. I don't know. Um, anyway, these students they. At this point, I think they recognize that they, they had lost whatever they were trying, to, whatever high ground they thought they had, uh, gone. All right, I'm going to play only a little bit more, then I'll start talking more. So she's saying, you chose CUNY because you knew what would happen here. Again, she thought I came there to get a reaction. Uh, like, I have nothing better with my life than to troll a bunch of 1Ls, right? I, I, I have a career. I don't, I don't need to get a rise out of these students who scream about effing the law. That's not my, that's, I don't care. But that's what they think, right? Their conception is that, okay, you're some sort of Fox News right-wing nut job who just came here to get like on Tucker Carlson, right? I actually got on Tucker after this, but not coincidentally, but that's not why I did it. It was actually Mark Stein guest host, but you know, it's still so good. Okay, so one student said, look how many protests there are, and look how many students are actually came to see you, hear you speak. I'm like, yeah, good, good for you. She's still covering her face. So the girl covering her face said, I don't want to listen to this, let's go. They could only handle six minutes, one minute of actual engagement. They could not handle any discussion. I wasn't yelling at them, I wasn't being mean to them, I was giving them more respect than they possibly could have deserved. I was treating them with courtesy that was not warranted in the least. They didn't deserve it, I could have flipped out at them. I, I played it cool. And, and the girl says, I don't want to hear this. She couldn't even listen to what I had to say. They were so intent on stopping me from speaking that when I started to speak, they couldn't listen. They wanted to get out of there. They couldn't handle the truth. They couldn't handle the law. They were in some warped reality. And then I tell them to leave. I don't care. So on her way out, the, the one with the hat says, I think you're tired. Um, you know, that's like a, a, a taunt that your five-year-old say. I think you're tired, right? Uh, yeah, and someone just friendly said, fuck. There was no actual, it was just, it was just an utterance. It's, there was nothing, it was like, fuck. And then they sort of trailed off, she had nothing else to say. She couldn't finish the sentence, you know, to you know, the law. She couldn't even put the rest of the sentence together. And that last one sort of walked out. How could you let this happen? And they're all filtering out the room. And the room's still pretty empty. Okay. You get you get the gist. So what happened next? Um, after that, I think it went uphill. <laughs> it got better. Um, 
The remaining students, and there were, you know, maybe five or six of them, uh, asked me questions on everything, right? You know, ask me anything. They were asking about uh, constitutional law, criminal law, criminal justice, slavery, right? Uh, uh, segregation, abortion, uh, climate change, um, uh, privacy. And they asked me every question. And I felt like I was an ambassador to a foreign land that was bringing this, this gift of knowledge, people who had never been exposed to it. Like, I, I felt like I was speaking a different language because all they had ever heard about conservatism was like basically a Fox News caricature, or maybe how MSNBC characterizes a Fox News caricature. There's no actual interaction. Um, and there were students there who I think actually, uh, I made an impact on. So there was one guy who was holding up a sign, and the sign said, Josh Blackman is an oppressor. I mean, I'm an oppressor. I don't even know what that means. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm a tough grader, maybe that's it. But I am an oppressor, I'm a very tough grader. Uh, but Josh Blackman is an oppressor. And I answered maybe five or six questions from over the hour. And then we chatted for a bit. He was actually from Houston, uh, nice enough guy. And I gave him my card, whatever, right? Gave him my card. He gave me an email later today. And the email blew me away. Okay, here's what the email said. Ready for this? I no longer have enough evidence to conclude that you are an oppressor. <laughs> that I shifted the burden, right? That I, that I, re, I rebutted the presumption of oppressiveness. That, again, I no longer have enough evidence to conclude that you are an oppressor. Maybe you still are. But, you know, it's like a motion to dismiss. There's a plausible case or not. We'll let discovery proceed to decide if there's actually evidence of you. I'll take it. <laughs> so. I think that as a positive step, right? That when you actually have these students who are utterly unaware of how other people think, and you sit and you listen to me talk for 45 minutes, not a very long time, that your perception will in fact change. That your preconceptions, dare I say your prejudices, might not be accurate. Um, now, most of the protesters who stormed out of the room never heard from me again, never heard me speak. Uh, as I understand it, they actually went to the dean's office and were complaining to the dean that I was even allowed to speak. So they never heard me, and they have no idea what I had to say. Now, let me fast forward this video, the end, and then the room's full. That's the guy in the back holding the sign with the long hair. He, he was a nice enough guy. Uh, I, I had a very nice conversation with them afterwards. Um, the room was full. And the students told me that they were not there at the beginning because they were afraid to be seen with me. Um, what happened afterwards? Well, after the event, I indeed exited the room. No one physically harmed me in any meaningful way. And uh, I was sort of expecting the dean to call me or email me and say, I'm really sorry this happened. Uh, maybe the professors at the college would contact me saying, Josh, I'm really sorry this happened. I got zip. Not a word from the college, not a word from the faculty, nothing. Um, I think the dean is basically under insane pressure from this activist student body that were she to even like make any gesture of comedy, a friendship towards me, she'd be seen as associated with an oppressor. To their credit, they didn't disinvite me, they didn't exclude me from the building, they could have. I, I give them that much credit. Uh, but I, I actually saw the dean at a conference over the summer. <laughs> she pretended not to know me. I said, I'm Josh Blackman. Oh, good to meet you. And she sort of walked away. Um, uh, New York has very good FOIA laws, like across Florida. So I FOIA her emails. I know she knows who I am. Um, they hired a PR crisis firm to deal with my situation. So I, I, they expended taxpayer dollars on handling me. I know you know who I am, whatever. Um, now let me take a step back and sort of synthesize to, to big issues. Uh, this is not common. I give maybe 40 or 50 federal events a year. I do these all over the country. I've never had anything even remotely close to this. This was an outlier. I think this is some sort of Marxist bastion in, in New York City 
that doesn't exist anywhere else. And that, they would actually be happy to call it Marxist. That's not a pejorative. They would actually embrace that label. Um, this doesn't happen often, uh, but it does happen more often uh, than it used to. And the ones you see on TV are people like Milo Yiannopoulos and Ben Shapiro, but I'm not nearly at their level. I'm, I'm a law professor, you know, I wrote a couple books, but I'm not super, I'm not like up there. And when these things happen, you know, this doesn't make the New York Times, it made Fox News, the other networks didn't uh, even cover it. Uh, people might say, well, Josh, you know, you were allowed to speak eventually, no big deal, right? They let you speak eventually. And I think that that's, that's a terrible way of looking at it. Uh, there was another event recently in Portland where uh, a speaker was giving a talk on criminal justice and the student didn't like it. So the student stood in front of him with a cowbell and he was banging a cowbell for one hour straight. Did not stop. Um, you probably haven't heard of this story, but these things are happening. <coughs> and the modern day response to speech you don't like is to stop that speech, not counter speech, but to stop that speech. So I'll leave you with three questions that I think are worthwhile. Um, who gets to decide on invitations? Uh, I am a very strong believer in that student group should have autonomy, independence, to invite people they think will contribute to the college campus. Um, I think it's a very bad idea when the administration of any sort uh, puts a thumb on the scale and says yay or nay who you can invite. Uh, because that's open to such abuse, uh, and it's completely arbitrary. Um, second question I want to leave you with is, once an invitation is made, um, what is a disruption, right? What's the line between a demonstration and a disruption? And that's a very hard line to draw. I think in my case, I was disruptive, even though I got to speak eventually. They, they screwed up my talk, they made me change my topic, and they were speaking over me. And the third question, and any of the judges who perhaps do sentencing might want to think about this, if there is a disruption, what is the proper discipline? Um, expulsion, letter to the character and fitness, um, denial of extracurriculars, uh, community service, right? What would actually teach these students what they did was wrong? And what might deter other students from engaging in similar conduct, right? Punishment has many, many justifications. It's to punish the act and also deter future misconduct, right? How should the school have gone ahead and disciplined these students? Okay, I'll leave it there uh, and I'll take some questions. Thank you all so much. Okay, questions? Yes, yes sir. Okay, so the question was, um, what's my reaction to what Yale Law School is doing? Let me, let me just summarize what's happening at Yale. Um, I didn't go to Yale. Uh, my law school didn't give me a damn penny for anything. But at Yale, if you uh, take summer employment at a nonprofit, the school can provide you with effectively as a stipend, right? So they want to encourage you to work at nonprofits. Also at Yale, if you take a job with some sort of public interest work, they have what's effectively a loan forgiveness program where they'll, they'll, they'll pay off at least part of your student loans. Um, recently, the students at Yale complained that some of this loan forgiveness money and uh, public interest summer stipends was being put towards what they deemed hate groups. Uh, in particular, uh, groups like the ADF, which is Alliance of Freedom, and the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and a few others. And the argument is that these groups have a, a, a hostility towards gays and lesbians, and the school should not be subsidizing um, uh, their, their, their policies. Uh, almost immediately, uh, Ted Cruz and, and, and uh, Tom, uh, Josh Hawley from Missouri, who are both Ivy League uh, uh, law grads, uh, flipped out, and they said, you can't do this. Um, there are general prohibitions in federal education law that says uh, schools can't discriminate on the basis of religion. I'm going to pause on answering your actual question because the policy doesn't exist yet. Uh, the dean sort of put out this press statement and said we'll release the policy later. I haven't actually seen the actual policy, so I don't know what it says. Uh, but I'll make two, uh, two general points. Um, this was very obviously a move that was motivated by 
uh, student hostility towards these religious groups. That, that, that's undeniable. Um, how that hostility factors into educational law, I am not an expert, but this is an issue that we should all watch very closely. Okay, that's what I have hand over here. Yeah, he, he bought my book, so he goes next. <laughs> See, it sounds like. Yeah, the University of Chicago is fairly unique. Um, they have a long-standing culture uh, to promote free speech, and they are very good on this. So about two weeks ago, uh, Professor Eugene Kantorovich, who uh, was at Northwestern, is now at George Mason, he was giving a talk on uh, BDS. This is an Israeli issue, but it's called Boycott, Divest, and Sanction. And uh, various pro-Palestinian groups were shouting him down and protesting. Uh, the administration showed up, they called campus security, and they removed the students from the room. And then he gave his talk in a quiet room. Uh, so Chicago is very unique in that regard. Uh, that didn't happen here. We had one dean show up who gave an empty warning, said, I'll be back, and she never came back. Uh, yes, sir. How effective do you think Turning Point USA is um, in terms of uh, educating uh, undergrads about conservative you know, I don't know much about TPUSA. I, I, I mean, I know they put speakers on campus. Um, I, I think when you're looking at the speakers, you have to ask, um, are they trying to promote ideas? Are they trying to get a rise at the left? You know, own the libs, as they say. I am not a fan of the own the libs strategy. I think it's not effective. I think words are far more effective. Uh, so I'd have to look in particular at their message. But I, I in general, uh, I want people to be exposed to as many ideas as they can be exposed to. That's my preference. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for thank your you. Um, excellent instruction on uh, Saul Alinsky being defeated by Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> um, oh, I like that. Saul Alinsky being defeated by Mahatma Gandhi. Never heard that one before. That's good. <laughs> but uh, could you talk about the underlying complaint that the students have or they've concocted in their minds that there's some fundamental injustice in the law because of class and privilege and, and, and people's different backgrounds? How do you kind of take that on in a way that kind of cuts through it? Yeah. Like yeah, so the question was, um, their underlying theory uh, is that the law is based on privilege and class and power. Um, this is not a new sentiment. This was very prominent during the critical legal studies movement. Um, what I usually respond, and this is not always effective, but what I try to respond is, when you say that I can't talk about a topic because I don't have a certain agency, that I'm not the right race or color, or I can't address an issue because I'm privileged, because I'm white and whatever else, um, you're effectively silencing, right? The effect of this dialogue, whatever merit it has, is you're telling me I can't talk about something of which I am knowledgeable about. Um, I try to say, if you give me 30 seconds, I'll articulate my views. If you think my views are wrong, uh, judge them on the merit rather than simply dismissing me as a person. It's, it's more or less an ad hominem. Um, now, the, the response is they don't really care. Uh, students who are committed to that view of the world, that whoever I am, I can't talk about a topic because of who I am, uh, it's more or less a lost cause. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the professors do um, do embrace that ideology. Um, in my classroom, anyone can make any point. I don't care who you are, I don't care where you come from. If you have an, a point, uh, an, an article to make, you can make it. Please. Well, I, I suppose about the underlying bias in the law itself, not your ability oh. to, to make it clear. Oh, I, I, mean, I mean, look, uh, we'll be candid here, right? There are lots of areas of the law that aren't fair. Um, I think much of our criminal justice system is, is, is in shambles. Um, I think it's unfortunate public defenders are overworked, they don't have enough time to negotiate. Uh, very few cases go to trial, most cases are pleaded out at have efficiency. I'll concede that there are a lot of things about the law that I don't like. Uh, but if you take the base position that our entire legal system is bogus, um, then you're in the wrong line of work. Um, instead of becoming a lawyer, you should run for Congress. Uh, you should run for state house. 
uh, you should maybe join a revolutionary you know, regime in a South American jungle somewhere, right? They're, they're, you're doing the wrong thing, right? Uh, if you want to have a debate on whether we should overthrow the United States government and replace it with a communist utopia, that is a good debate for somewhere else. Uh, in a law school, you're here to learn about a legal system. You can criticize it, you can say it's wrong, but if you reject the very basis of the legal system, what the hell are you doing with three years of your life? Why are you here, right? If you, you guys are sitting for your bar exam in a few months in the summer, the first question you write, F the law on your bar examination, <laughs> you're not gonna pass, right? Go do something else with your gifts and talents. You're, these kids are obviously very emotional, very passionate about what they believe. I love passion, I love it. But, but, but you have to at least accept the basic premise of the law to be a lawyer. Um, and if you don't, you should really consider finding other life options. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you all so much. Thank you. And I'll be happy to answer questions after if you don't care about Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no more questions. Thank you all for coming. Uh, remember, we have a next event, June 13th, the phone call. And again, there are some books out in the uh, lobby for purchase, and Josh would like to take around the future. Any questions before we sign